welcome to the sixth, I can't believe this is the sixth Evolution Live, um, live on my own, from my house. Um, welcome back. The sun is now shining. It has literally been the foulest weather up until five minutes ago. So if the lighting all changes in and out, we'll get through it. Um, welcome back. Uh, last week we were doing sexual selection and this week we are doing speciation. To, so to those of you who are new to Evolution Live, hello, I am Dr. Sally LePage, I am an evolutionary biologist, my PhD is in evolution and I am giving these lectures, I suppose, classes, live streams, whatever you want to call them, um, in evolution every week. They will be available on my YouTube channel afterwards so that um, if you want to go back and watch any of the earlier ones you can. They started off um, pretty low level for someone with no background in evolution and they've been building up over the last six weeks. So, um, welcome to everyone joining in the morning. Ah, oh, hello, hello America. Um, I tried to set a time so that both America and the UK could join because that's where most of my audience are from anyway. Um, so, last week, uh, I should point out that if I get distracted, those of you that have been here a while know, I am doing everything and that includes um, sorting out all of the music and effects and everything so I, I'll get quite distracted but now the background music is on I can take these off I can stop listening to myself with like a one second delay which is really difficult to cope with um, and so yes we last week we were doing sexual selection and as a um, previously on evolution live in the last episode of evolution live uh, we covered how sexual selection is a type of natural selection, so it's in the subset of natural selection, and it's where individuals compete to reproduce. So males compete more, um, so there's more competition within males than there is within females, and that's why we end up with elaborate male um, weapons and also ornaments. And we were talking all about peacocks um, last week, so that was very good fun. Um, this week we have got speciation. We are very literally talking about the origin of species. Yes, it may just seem like a title now, but we are literally talking about how species originate, how they come into being. Um, because, I was going to say as far as we know it, but... Um, it's pretty much the case. <laughs> it's one of those things in science. The more scientific you get, the more expert you are, the less certainty you say things. Um, so in science speak, to the best of our knowledge, in lay speak, it's a fact that um, all the species on Earth share a common ancestor. And so that means that starting from one species, we now have millions of species. So how do we get there? Um, so yes, we're going to be looking at speciation. Um, so the first thing we should probably start with is, bing, 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 what is a species? It's one of those words where you kind of know what it is, but as soon as you start to define it, it gets a little bit tricky. Um, and so because I have been following along with the um, GCSE, AS level and A level courses for the UK, so that's the exams for when you're 16, 17 and 18, just so that I make sure that I, I am covering the stuff that you need to cover in secondary school and then going off on a tangent and actually covering the interesting things. Um, they say that a species is a group of similar organisms that can reproduce to give fertile offspring. Um, and for the first time this week, we're going to move over to the notebook. Um, so, um, so supposedly a species is a group of similar organisms.
um, that can reproduce to give fertile offspring. I put hand cream on before filming and now my hands are sticking to the um, tablet. It's the um, to give fertile offspring. It just shows that we've all been washing our hands properly if everyone's got really dry, flaky hands. Um, so that's the textbook. Literally, I have, I bought the textbooks. Um, that is the textbook definition of what is a species. However, as with most things, the more you get into biology, the more you realise it's not actually that simple. Um, and there are anywhere between five and 20 different definitions of a species, each one focusing on a slightly different um, aspect. So this is what is known as the biological species concept. And that's because it's all about, um, where's my highlighter pen? That's because it's all about reproducing to give fertile offspring. Um, and obviously that is important. Um, however, there are other definitions. So for example, there is the evolutionary species concept, which is that species are um, genetically independent evolutionary lineages. And we're going to be talking next week more about lineages and the tree of life and phylogenies and things like that. But if you think about your family tree, you can think of it branching up from your great grandparents through to your grandparents, to your parents, and then to you. Um, the evolutionary species concept is one that is all on the same branch. Then you have more of an ecological concept where a species is a group of organisms that share the same niche. Or if you're American, niche. And you're wrong, it's niche. N-I-C-H-E. Um, a niche is, in the simplest terms, the the role that a species fills. Yes, I realise that I'm using niche to define species and species to, find, to define niche. Um, but you basically, so a species, so a niche is a, um, is an n-dimensional hyperspace where each of the dimensions is a different ecological parameter, but that's a little bit confusing. So um, a niche is, is kind of the role that a species plays in the ecosystem. So maybe you decompose, you live in dark, damp places in a moderate, um, temperate environment and you're small. Uh, that could be the niche for a woodlouse, for example. But um, a lot of definitions are that no two species can occupy the same niche otherwise there will be too much competition it's your niche is kind of like what you're competing for and so by definition species have to have separate niches so that's another um definition of of species but the one that the textbooks want you to know is it is the most common one. It's groups of organisms that can reproduce together successfully. So you're not going to produce a mule, which is a horse and a donkey. They can breed, but the mule is um, infertile. It is a mule. No, is it, is it, it is a mule that is the hybrid offspring of the two. I think it is. Um, so, oh, and it's important to add that um, species are made up of populations, which are a group of organisms of the same species. occupying a particular space, oops, occupying, didn't give myself enough room there, a particular space at a particular time
that can potentially interbreed. Um, good, I was right for Mule. Um, thank you people in the comments. I do read the comments, I just don't often respond to them. Um, so, species is every single individual within the species. Uh, so, all grey squirrels are of the same species. However, the species of grey squirrels contains multiple populations. So for example, there's the European population, or the British population of grey squirrels. There is the North American population of grey squirrels. Because although they're the same species, if we were to bring them together on a boat, um, do a kind of blind date sort of thing, they could reproduce and produce fertile offspring because they are still the same species. But they never really experience each other. So they're kind of distinct entities in and of themselves. People, someone's talking about koi dogs. What the fuck is a koi dog? Is that a coyote and a dog? Never heard of it before. Um, other than a very shy dog. Oh, it's so coy. Uh, okay, so that is what a species is. So now we can talk about speciation, or as I call it, the ultimate in social distancing. Um, and so because we are defining species as groups of organisms that can successfully reproduce, we define two groups as being different species if they can't successfully reproduce. It's quite logical. And so not being able to reproduce together, we call reproductive isolation. And speciation requires reproductive isolation. Um, so we're all in social isolation at the moment. We're talking about reproductive isolation. Um, And you have to have this for speciation. It is impossible for um, for there to be speciation without reproductive isolation. There are many ways in which you can create reproductive isolation, as we shall be talking about over the next 45 minutes. Um, you have to have reproductive isolation. Otherwise, it doesn't meet the definition of being a new species. And so there are three main ways in which you can no longer mate with someone. I was gonna say that used to be of your species. We'll talk at the end about how this is all very weird and we're squaring the circle and none of this really makes biological sense. But um, <laughs> before I talk about how all of this is potentially not wrong, but a futile Sisyphus task. Is that the right adjective for Sisyphus? Sis Sisyphus. You're rolling a ball up a hill to no avail. Um, so reproductive isolation you get through timing. You get through what I love is in the textbook they just define this as mechanical changes. and behavior so how okay um so timing so imagine you are a let's go with an anemone Be, no a coral because i made a video about corals and i got to watch this happening in the lab and it was super cool so corals you know those rocky things under the sea they're actually animals you never believe it but they are um and they release eggs and sperm, like every other sexually producing thing. And, and so they release them all at the same time. So they broadcast spawn. So rather than YouTube, broadcast yourself, broadcast your eggs and your sperm. Uh, maybe it's just like YouTube. But um, rather than having internal fertilization, they have external fertilization. And so then it means that they all have to synchronize. 
because otherwise you've got all of these eggs floating around in the water and there's no sperm there to fertilize them and then they die before they get fertilized. Equally, the sperm has to be around at the same time that there's eggs, otherwise none of that happens. And if you imagine that there are, there's one population and they all spawn on the 30th of April, because that's what the date is today. They all like, okay, we all spawn on the 30th of April, but then you've got another population that maybe was of the same species, maybe it used to spawn on the 30th of April, but for reasons we will go into, now spawns on the 1st of April. And so there's a whole month between them. Even though if you forced, like if you froze the eggs and froze the sperm and then woke them up at the same time, brought them together, they could still produce fertile offspring. You, they will never meet each other. The eggs will never meet the sperm. And so you end up with, because of timing, two reproductively isolated communities. Um, so you can often get this um, if it's time of day, time of year, um, seasons, all of those kind of things. Then you get mechanical changes. Basically, the genitals don't fit together properly anymore. So um, as we talked about last week with sexual selection, there is a huge amount of selection happening on anything to do with reproduction. I mean, last week I was talking about the tiny little fruit fly that's six millimeters long that has sperm that is six centimeters long. Yes, it has sperm 10 times longer than its body. If you missed that, go watch last week's after this. And, um, and so that is, oh, Robert said, is there a fourth one? Geography. I will get onto that. Think about that. So, uh, so this is a reproductive isolation. So there are huge amounts of selective pressure on genitals, particularly because as we mentioned last week, you get positive feedback loops when the female choice is involved. And so slight changes can suddenly run away. That's literally the term, run away into big changes. And so it's quite possible for the, um, for the genitals to be the wrong shape or size, so the penis doesn't fit in the vagina anymore, or for the, maybe there needs to be an, another part, so there's another part of stimulation that's required, or that the sperm is no longer compatible to fertilize the egg and vice versa. All of these literal structural morphological changes that mean that fertilization can't happen anymore. And then thirdly, we have behavior. So a lot of the really interesting things in reproduction are behavioral, they're courtship displays, they're competition. And so if you imagine that a female is choosing, if it's a bird, the bird with the bluest tail, and you're like, oh, that's so sexy. Sexy sun hypothesis as we covered last week. I want, um, I'm only going to mate if the male displays a blue tail, but then another group of this species changes so that they only like, um, that's a really bad, that's a morphological example, they, okay, they're like, I only like males that sing Despacito to me, and it's a song Despacito that means that I will choose that male to have my babies. I mean, I've heard it enough on the radio over the last decade that there's got to be some truth in that, right? But then another group of individuals think, no, I actually want um, Ed Sheeran singing out loud. And if the male does not sing Ed Sheeran, then I refuse to mate. And so although there's nothing structurally different, the male behavior that's required for courtship is different. And so those are the three ways in which you can have reproductive isolation. Now, Robert Leyland mentioned, is geography a way of having reproductive isolation? So this is the distinction, is that you can have geographical isolation without having reproductive isolation. The two are not the same. And so you can have two populations that get geographically separated, but unless something happens, if they're then brought back together, they can still breed, and so they are still the same species. They haven't lost the ability to reproduce with each other. And so speciation, um, 
we can actually define as... There's a lot of definitions in this episode. Um, if you like definitions, lucky you. <laughs> it's mostly so that I know that the basics are being covered. Um, so speciation... is when um, there are changes in allele frequencies. If there are words here that are unfamiliar to you, um, you can go back and watch some of the earlier episodes when we we're talking about genes and alleles, changes in allele frequencies, so that's our standard definition of evolution. Um, in different populations of a species, Um, that cause changes in phenotypes. So, so far I've just defined evolution. Some evolution has happened. Um, that means um, they can no longer interbreed. to produce fertile offspring. So there has to be a genetic aspect to it, because otherwise, if there's just geographical separation, you've just got two different populations. Whereas reproductive isolation means that even if they're brought back together, they can no longer breed and speciation requires reproductive isolation. So geographical isolation is not sufficient. And in fact, as we're gonna go on to, it's not even necessary. Um, and so for two things to be important, it needs, the tests in biology, is it sufficient and is it necessary? And geographical isolation is neither sufficient nor necessary for reproductive isolation. Okay, but the next topic is physical separation. So, are any of you, by any chance, called Patrick? Because this is going to be a great episode if you are called Patrick. Um, patria, obviously meaning country, um, as in like pro, pro patria mori, um, to die for one's country, um, or patriotic. Um, is anyone called Patrick? No, sadly. Um, I'm not quite sure how long the delay is in the chat, but I don't think there is. Because, hello, Patrick, is the word of the day. Um, so, hello, Patrick, speciation is when you get speciation that does result from physical separation. But, of course, there is also speciation that doesn't require it. So, hello, Patrick, speciation. Um, someone's got a cousin called Patricia. Unfortunately, it's not hello, Patricia. It's hello, Patrick. Um, so it's literally hello, Patrick. Speciation. I'm going to write speciation in small because it's mostly hello, Patrick. Um, there we go. Roro Magoro is actually a Patrick. So hello, Patrick. Um, and so hello means... Um, I suppose it means different or um, not the same. Um, so this bit we know is meaning like land or country. And this bit is um, kind of different. So it means geographical separation. So allopatric speciation is when speciation occurs because of a physical barrier in between two populations. Um, and so there are so many examples of physical barriers. Um, we've got, uh, let's have um, nice little green, what animals am I going to go for today? Um, I'm going to go for little 
To be honest, let's just go for little balls with smiley faces. These are animals. If you can't tell, they are. I am an expert, therefore what I say is true. Um, <laughs> and they're just happy little animals without care in the world. And they're like, yeah, this is nice. And then suddenly overnight, they're like, oh my God, a mountain range has formed in between us. How did we not notice that? How did it pop up in the middle? Um, so this would be a physical barrier um, that stops. So previously they were able to interbreed, um, but this stops that from happening. Um, but you could also, um, as well as a mountain range, oops, you could have a river. And if these little animals, or even plants, um, any sexual species, don't like getting their feet wet, then before they could breed, and now no more breeding. Um, you could also have that they are... Ooh, I know. Um, I have to... Oops. So they were all together and they live on a hilly mountain range. And before it used to be that this was kind of where they liked to live. This is the right temperature for them. Um, but as global warming happened, um, they needed to move to a cooler climate. And obviously the higher in altitude you go, the cooler it gets. And so they all kind of start going up the mountain, but then these ones end up getting funneled up this peak and these ones end up getting funneled up this peak. And so now again, they've been separated and they could no longer breed. So you often get that. Um, obviously islands are very common for speciation. If you have one species that then gets split across lots of different islands. So these are all examples of a physical barrier causing geographical separation. But as we've already mentioned, geographical separation is not enough for reproduction um, to reproductive isolation to happen. So you've also got to have changes in allele frequencies that prevent the two populations from being able to successfully reproduce. Um, yes, a president building a wall, if it was an impermeable wall, might cause the separation. Uh, so you've got to have differences in genes. So how do we get differences in genes? Well, funnily enough, we have covered these topics um, in the previous five episodes, uh, but we get directional selection is a big one. So remember, um, you might remember this graph where you had a trait that was normally distributed. So maybe it's a height and they're all um, 50 centimeters tall, but then there's an advantage to being taller. And so over time they end up getting shifted to a taller height. Well, that um, shift is caused by a selective pressure, which is often the environment. So something about the environment makes it advantageous to be tall. Well, if the lovely little um, green monsters up here, if maybe these ones live in, so maybe this all used to be a lovely green environment, and these ones here, it's all lush and there's lots of plants and everything. Um, and they're like, yay, this is happy. Um, we're nice and green, it's all good. But then this one maybe is a slightly different environment. Maybe this one, all the plants are, I'm not gonna pick red because I know about colorblind. Uh, all the plants are purple, you know? because that's a common thing that happens. Um, and so there's now a different selection pressure on these. So these ones turn into purple blobs because what is advantageous on one side of the physical barrier might be different to what is advantageous on the other side of the barrier. And so there is directional selection. And if that occurs in different directions because of differences in the environment, that will create 
um, differences in allele frequencies in each population, that means that they can no longer breed. Um, oh, interesting question from Mara Senna. Do things that give birth and live shorter evolve faster? Yes. So evolution happens um, based on generations, assuming that there is a f something fairly constant. So the more generations you can squeeze into a shorter period of time, the faster your ability to evolve. Um, obviously, there are things with incredibly fast um, generation time. So E. coli has a 20 minute um, generation time at 25 degrees C, 20 degrees C, one of the two, room temperature. Optimal conditions, it can divide every 20 minutes. And, and so they have more of a possibility for change. Um, so that is one way in which you can get um, allele frequencies that are different on one side of a physical barrier to another. Another one is that uh, you get novel mutations. So this is not someone writing fan fiction about their favorite fictional book. Um, this is new mutations. So of course in episode two, I think we were talking about um, how the genetics of evolution and kind of how you've got this genetic code and the letters and you can change out some of the letters and that is mutation. And this happens at a kind of random rate. There are muted gens. Remember, these are things that increase the rate of mutation. So that can be ionizing radiation, so UV light. Um, certain chemicals increase the chance of uh, mutations happening, all of these things. And so it might be that you've got this population over here. I'm simplifying them. Um, and this population over here. And maybe both of them could benefit from having spikes. But the, the mutation required for spikes only happens on this side. And so only this population gets the spikes. Um, not because it wouldn't be beneficial for this side to have spikes, but simply because that mutation didn't arise. There wasn't a variation required for evolution to happen. Remember, evolution requires variation. And then finally, we have genetic drift. Now, I keep mentioning this, um, and I keep never really discussing what it is. And remember, this is the random, I don't know why I did um, speech marks, I meant to do part of evolution. That means it's not natural selection. Natural selection is non-random. There is a reason why some forms, some alleles, some um, traits do better than others. Genetic drift is random. If you take five individuals out of a population of 10, by chance, you might pick all five, uh, uh, let's say you've got, um, going back to our chocolate buttons, because that's why I did it with small numbers. If you've got five milk and five white chocolate buttons and you pick two of them, there is a five cent, uh, 15, there is a 25% chance that you will pick two of the same color. No, there is a 50% chance you'll pick two of the same color. There's a 25% chance that you will pick two milk chocolate buttons. Um, and that's not because milk chocolate buttons are better than white chocolate buttons, although arguably they are. That's just because when you're choosing from a, a number of individuals from such a small bag, if you've only got 10 buttons um, and you're choosing randomly, it's quite possible to end up with what looks like a skewed result by chance. It's just as if you th toss a coin 10 times, some of the time you will get just heads. And that won't be because you've got a biased coin, just because strange things happen every now and again when you're going around the twist. Um, and someone wins the lottery 
That doesn't mean it's not hard to win the lottery, but it's just, it happens so many times. The improbable things are st still happen. And so genetic drift is when randomly, say the river springs up out of nowhere, separates our two populations. And it just so happens to be that all of the bigger animals were on that side of the river and all the smaller animals were on that side of the river. Now you've got genetic differences between the populations. Um, so there's no rhyme nor reason to it, but it does happen more with smaller populations because we're talking about like the law of chances. Um, if you, it's much more likely that you're going to get only heads if you toss a coin 10 times than if you toss a coin a million times. That's why the size of the population matters so much. And often in speciation, you get what's called a bottleneck um, because obviously a bottle is shaped like this. That is quite clearly a bottle. Um, and so you start off with something that's quite large and it ends up, squeezing down into something quite small. So you can imagine if you've got this big population, um, say it's a group of um, primates coming from Africa, and then only a small part of them um, go off to form their own little population. I don't know what I'm drawing here. That's the other population. You can see they've gone through this bottleneck here. So you end up with a smaller population. Okay, so that is physical separation. That is allopatric um, speciation. When you get changes in genes because of directional selection, novel mutations and genetic drift that occur as a result of a physical barrier. I've never seen The Witcher. Is it any good? Is it scary? I don't like scary things. That's the first thing. But I do need stuff to watch during the shutdown. Okay, so that is physical separation. We now have a separate but together. This is called sympatric speciation. And it is amazingly controversial given how matter-of-factly it's described in school textbooks and at high school level. Um, let's move my bottle out of the way. So we're talking about sympatric. So sim meaning same. Patrick again meaning place. So this is um, where you get two parts, so you've got one population and despite being in the same place, it ends up dividing into two parts. So, oh no, I'm, I'm awful with jump scares. I can do horror, but I can't do jump scares. I won't be watching it then. And you can ask questions at the end. You can ask questions throughout. I There's only so much I can talk about the comments, but the eighth lesson, so not the next one, but the one after that, I'm gonna to dedicate to a whole load of questions, just so you know. Um, so in plants, this is a lot more possible. In part because plants can often reproduce sexually and asexually. So if you think um, you can have, your plant can produce seeds, but you can also take a cutting and clone it that way. Um, and what plants often do, which is quite cool, is this thing called polyploidy. So if you imagine you've got, I don't know, um, one, two, three, four. Imagine that is your genome. So it's got four chromosomes, chromosomes being collections of genes. So your genome is split into four. But then sometimes it randomly doubles um, and due to a copying error. And now you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And this is polyploidy. Um, poly meaning many. Ploidy kind of means number of chromosomes. I mean, it doesn't strictly, but it kind of does. 
So you've probably heard of diploid organisms because they've got two of each ploidy set of chromosomes. Haploid have half the set. Triploid have three. Um, so that is one change that causes massive changes throughout the genome. Everything is doubled. What? Plants do this very successfully. Um, and it gives them lots of freedom to evolve, which is super cool. Um, but it means that maybe this new mutant can't reproduce with the old ones, even though they're in the same place. In animals, if you double your genome, you typically die. <laughs> there are very few, if any, cases of polyploidy working in animals. Um, I mean, for example, Down syndrome is a result of one chromosome being duplicated throwing everything else out of whack like we are very as animals we're very sensitive <laughs> to our chromosome numbers being messed with and so usually that doesn't work um so oh it's starting to rain again i do quite like the sound of rain um so this means that in animals sympatric speciation ought to happen but there are so few examples that it's like normally you'll learn okay this allopatric and the sympatric speciation the speciation that happens when they're separated physically and the speciation that happens when they're not separated physically but let's be honest it's nearly always allopatric speciation it's nearly always happens because of physical barrier because the chances of having two distinct groups of oh it's really chucking oh it's really chucking it down how exciting uh the chance of having two very distinct groups coming out when they're under the same environment so they have the same selective pressure and are constantly being able to interbreed until the point that they're no longer able to interbreed that is that is a big ask for any species we do have some examples um so we've got where did i put them up here bring it down a bit um so we've got this which i think is a surprisingly good looking fly and as a fly biologist i think i get a pretty decent say in um <laughs> Someone says in a stunning turn of events, it's raining in England. It has not, it, it started raining yesterday and it has not rained in about a month. Literally, we had storm after storm after storm. And by storm, I mean, they're so big that they get names um, that occurred every single weekend. And then lockdown happened and it has been glorious sunshine, very unseasonably. Um, it has been like April showers. There has been no showers in April and now it's chucking it down. Hence the excitement. Yes, I am a Brit and I am talking about the weather. Um, so here is a very good looking fly with a terrible name. It's called the apple maggot fly. Um, and of course all flies come from maggots, but most people don't think about that. Um, and it lays its eggs and its maggots in apples surprise surprise so you've got an apple apple don't sue me um and the little flies come and lay their eggs and then you get lots of little maggots eating the rotten apple and then in the same orchard you often it's almost like flies come from maggots yeah in the same way that butterflies come from caterpillars flies come from maggots that's the life cycle. Um, so, you know, you get, okay, pause. Um, so you got egg, caterpillar, pupa, beautiful butterfly. That is the caterpillar aka lava um with flies you have big teeth uh 
Um, in flies, you have egg, you have um, this, which is in common English, the maggot in science English, larva, pupa, fly. Um, yeah, so lots of people don't realize that maggots grow into um, flies. There you go. Uh, so the apple maggot fly, which I'm sure someone can do it. Apple bottom jeans, boots with the fur, with the fur. And um, so apple maggot fly lays its eggs on an apple, on an apple. And the whole world's looking at her. Um, yes, yeah, someone's saying my Patreon levels are in fact named after this life cycle of a, of a fly. Um, so you can start off for $1 a month as an egg. Progress your way, first instar, second instar, third instar, and wandering larvae, because there are molts between each of the stages. Um, so there are three and a half types of maggot. Then you pupate, and then you form an adult fly, also known as the Amago. Um, but then some of these maggots in the same orchard, there were... Um, whores. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I literally mean that. Um, so this is a whore. Um, and it grows on a very thorny bush, which is why we call it a hawthorn. Ah, bet you didn't realise where that got its name from. Um, watch my foraging video for endless innuendos about whores. Um, whores and hips. And we're collecting rose hips and thorn, hawthorn whores. Um, and so some of these flies worked out how to grow their maggots on whores rather than on apples. And so even though they're in the same orchard, they were able to split off. Um, you then get cichlid fish as well, which are fish, quite small fish. Um, and it's, they live in lakes, so there's a lot of lakes in Africa. So you get a lot of allopatric, allopatric speciation. Um, because if you imagine, say there was a big flood and then they get separated into two different lakes, you'll end up um, with different conditions in each lake and get lots of different species. But even within the same lake, you end up with the, them splitting into different species. So this was a bit of a puzzle. And it could be to do, because some of them like to stay at the surface and some of them like to go down the bottom. So although they could take up the same geographical, physical space, they separated themselves out anyway. Um, what I'm saying is it's possible for species to, two uh, populations to diverge into separate species in the same place. It's very rare, but apparently you need to know about it anyway. But it's called sympatric speciation. Um, ah, I've already covered genetic drift. Um, I was just going to allude to it before, which is good because it also explains why I've only got 10 minutes of time left. Genetic drift is the non-random part of evolution. Remember, evolution has a random part, drift, and a non-random part, natural selection. And it's a numbers game. So the more individuals you have in a population, the less likely small random chances are gonna influence it. Whereas the smaller your population, the more likely small random chances are gonna influence it. Which is also why you end up um, once a population gets so small, so say there are, I don't know, 20 Siberian tigers left in the wild. I know there are more than that, but there's still not that many. Once you get down to that smaller number, even though there are still some alive, sometimes that can be the end of the species because there's just not enough variation left. Um, so that's the alley effect, not to mix with the allele, or the Sally effect, um, which is everywhere you go, there are houseplants. Uh, but the Alley effect is that um, weird things happen to populations when they're very small in number. So the last point, and it gets a bit philosophical here, but 
dividing a continuum. You've got to remember that every individual was made, was born or cloned from one before it. With the exception of the very first one, which we're not really sure about. I don't really think about the origin of life. That's a tricky topic. Um, One for the scientific philosophers out there. But everyone was born from something. And it's like, which came first, the chicken or the egg? In this case, the egg very much came first. But, because of course, you not only get species separating in horizontal, but I, oh, I, need to, I need to draw this. Okay, so we're gonna do more about the tree of life next week. If you imagine you've got, um, is that the biggest? It? Yeah, you've got this and trying to time it right. There we go. Ignore me, just getting rid of the red pen. There we go. See what I did there. Um, and then you get branching off at various points. So we not only say that at this branching point here, we went from having one species to having two species. We can also say sometimes that take this branching off point is the same. I just didn't want to write on the same thing. Um, so on the left, you've got species A. Maybe it goes into A and B. Maybe this stays the same. Or maybe you've got species A and it goes into species B and C. So here we've obviously got speciation. Um, this species is different from, um, from this species, sorry. But here you can also see this species is different from this species. So there was animal A, animal A, animal A, animal A, and then at some point it becomes animal B, animal B, animal B. But that would imply that at some point there was an animal that was born from a different species. So the mother was a different species to the offspring, which obviously does not happen. Okay, like at some point the first chicken was born, but for there to be a first chicken, that means that that first chicken's mother had to not be a chicken. And that's because all of life is continuous um, and we are literally trying to, it's like defining the colors of the rainbow. We are literally trying to put into these nice species boxes a continuous, spread sometimes it works like humans and bananas are very clearly separate species we cannot produce fertile offspring together um bananas and e coli are very different species but what about humans and neanderthals were they separate species because we know that they could interbreed and produce fertile offspring because most europeans have Neanderthal DNA in them. Therefore, we some of us are the byproduct of those um, hybridizations producing fertile offspring. So, it's so the whole of speciation is very confusing, and that's why it's important that I talked about the different definitions of a species. There are so many definitions of a species because a species is, to some extent, a human attempt to categorize a system. To some extent, there are no natural species. Obviously there are, obviously some things can't produce with others. There are like clusters, but the edges, there are always a bit weird things going on. Um, and one of the weird things, which I think is really cool, is something called a ring species. Where, and this is, um, so what happens is, okay, so imagine you've got, I'm gonna do all the colors for this. 
So you've got species A. Oh, so you've got, um, doesn't help if you can't see it. Um, you've got population A that can breed with population B. And population B, so remember populations are within a species. Um, population B can breed totally fine with population C, which can breed totally fine with population D, which can breed totally fine with population E. However, E and A cannot interbreed. And that is because biology is not maths. Um, and just because there is a stepping point from each of these is not does not mean the same as that. So you can't say that A and B are different species because they can interbreed. Um, and B and C are the same species because they can interbreed. So technically that means that A, B and C are all part of the same species. But then technically that means that A, B, C and D are all part of the same species because D can interbreed with A, B and C. And technically that means A, B, C, D and E are all part of the same species even though A and E can't interbreed with each other and it all gets very confusing. It's like that, um, that power of how many is a pile of sticks. One is not a pile of sticks. Two is not a pile of sticks. A thousand sticks is a pile of sticks. But at what number does it go from not being a pile of sticks to being a pile of sticks? At what point do you put the cutoff line here? Like, uh, that just doesn't work. And this happens in a lot of cases. So this is the... Um, geographical spread of the black-backed gull. So it's a seagull. And you end up with um, this population here lives in Sweden and Norway. Um, and then it can breed with this population here, which can breed with this population here which, guess what, can breed with this population here. And that can breed with this population here. And that can breed with this population here. And that can breed with this population here. But these two can't breed. And so you end up with the British back, back, black backed gulls and the um, Scandinavian black-backed gulls looking actually quite different because there are slight differences between each of the populations. Um, just, you know, things happen. And even though they're physically quite close together, they can't breed. But they're all part of the same species, right? Because there is a, a connection that joins all of them together. So you can see why we call them ring species because they create a ring. Um, it is five o'clock. I have two very quick points. Um, bacteria are super confusing. You'll notice that our definition, um, so you've got bacteria that have their little um, genome like this in the side. Actually, they don't. They don't have a true nucleus. They've got their genome, but then they also have, they look a bit like fried eggs, don't they? Um, they also have these things, um, these little rings that also contain genetic information. And they're able to produce a little tunnel called a sex pillus. Um, so that DNA, you've gotten used to my terrible drawings by now, haven't you? can transfer from one to another, except they can do this between completely different types of bacteria. Um, because of course they all, all DNA uses the same code. Um, and so 
this happens with antibiotic resistance, for example. So one group of bacteria might learn how to become um, methicillin resistant if they were Staphylococcus aureus, it would be MRSA. And then they can give that methicillin resistance, antibiotic resistance gene to a completely different bacteria without breeding because they've not mixed this part of their genome they've just got kind of like these accessory bits of dna bacterial sex is really complicated and then of course even more than that our definition of species is based on being able to reproduce and produce fertile offspring what happens if you're an asexual species How on earth do you define a species based on being able to reproduce together when there is no reproduction? How do you define a bacterial species when that bacteria um, divides asexually? Um, quite a few animals divide asexually. And yes, you get these clusters of bacteria that we call species. Obviously, you've heard of different bacterial species. You've heard of... Staphylococcus aureus. You've heard of Escherichia coli. That's what the E stands for. Um, you've heard of Clostridium difficile, C. difficile. These are obviously different species of bacteria. They do very different things. But bacteria don't have sexual reproduction. So all of that is, yeah, different. So all of that is speciation um so you get different species when you get reproductive isolation which often happens as a result of geographical isolation but not always hello patrick um someone says shouldn't you redefine species then that's why there are many many different definitions of species i covered some of them at the start um, you kind of pick whichever one suits your role best because, as I just said, species is a bit of an arbitrary concept. So you can just pick and choose the definition based on what it is you have to do with it. Um, next week, we're going to be talking about genetic uh, lineages and the tree of life, how we are all part of the same family tree. We are all related. Um, and with that, we'll do phylogenies and that will kind of cover... Um, things like fossils as well and the one off that is going to be why is evolution true evidence for evolution and also a bit of a Q&A so if you've got questions based on the lessons so far so not like hey you didn't mention this topic can you talk about this because there'll probably be other videos about that but if there was something that confused you about sexual selection or something that confused you about this speciation or genetic mutation um then you can write it down, remember it, and we'll do that in two weeks' time. Um, so for now, um, I hope... Wait, has the background music been off? That's a bit of a shame. It should have been on repeat. Um, for now, I'm just going to say... Ah, oh, background music ran out. Anyway, um, have a lovely week. Enjoy the rain, if like me, um, you haven't been able to see the rain for a while. And I will see you same time, same place on here. Bye.